That little church on Liberty Hill. Come praise the Lord, let your cup be filled. Raise your voices and we'll sing. Let God's freedom ring from that little church on Liberty Hill. Good morning. Go ahead and open up to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. We've been hanging out in Matthew a while. We figured we'd jump over and give John a look. Uh, John chapter 12. um, As you know, we're going along through the life of Christ, not just any one particular gospel, but in all four gospels put together. And so we do jump back and forth depending on where different passages fall in the chronology. And so what we see here, we're going to transition from Matthew over to John. Let me just kind of lay out. There's a couple of verses Um, in Matthew, and then something Luke mentions, it all kind of sets the stage for why we flow into John 12. Remember, Jesus has just given uh, what's called the Olivet Discourse. His disciples come to him, say, Lord, when will the end come? When will you come into your kingdom? And all the, when's all this stuff going to happen? And he goes through the answer. I'm not going to rehash that. We just, you know, spent, uh, you know, five or six weeks on that. You can go back and check that out. And then so he finishes what's called the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 25, And then the first few verses of Matthew 26 says this, Now it came to pass when Jesus finished all these sayings, right, what he just got done teaching, that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. And so he finished telling you, When's the Son of Man coming? He gives the answer, and he tells them, In two days I'm going to be crucified. Verse 3, the chief priests, scribes, elders of the people, assembled at a place of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, and they plotted to take Jesus by trickery or deceit and to kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. And so, you know, Jesus has gone off. He's teaching his disciples, but it's letting us know the stage is being set. That while Jesus is out there on the Mount of Olives teaching his disciples, that elsewhere... The, the leaders, the Pharisees, the priests, that they're actually conspiring of how they might arrest Jesus because they're scared to do it during the feast because he's so popular. You arrest him during the feast, you'll have a mob on your hands. And then Luke, very briefly, a couple of verses that are just kind of sandwiched in between a couple other things going on, says in uh, 21, verse 37, and in the daytime, Jesus was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out to the mount, He went out and stayed at the mountain called Olivet. Okay, so that's just letting us know that in the day he's teaching, and at night they go out, I guess they're camping there on the Mount of Olives. Um, then early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. Okay, so now this is the next day. He, he was out on, with, out on the Mount of Olives with his disciples teaching, and the next day he's back in Jerusalem, and people are coming to him. And so that's where actually John uh, picks up some events that happen that the other ones don't record. So we're in John chapter 12. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's teaching. He's in the temple. And we get this in John chapter 12, verse 20. We're, it, it, there, there's just six or seven verses here, and we're just going to kind of go through them. All pretty simple stuff. Now, there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. And then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida and of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Let's just stop for a second, kind of just a weird, weird little thing. Jesus is teaching some Greeks, some Gentiles, that word Greek. Um, it was dominantly a Greek-speaking world, and so they just referred to everyone who wasn't Jewish as Greeks. And so uh, we don't know that they actually were from Greece. Uh, they just aren't Jewish. Um, so they come, and they're like, hey, we want to see Jesus. So they go to Philip. Philip goes to Andrew. Philip and Andrew go talk to Jesus. So who are these Greeks? Right? Let's just kind of dig into some details to kind of set up kind of the question of the teaching that Jesus is going to give. Um, most likely, some people have proposed some different things. I think the most likely answer is that these guys are what's called proselytes. They are Gentile uh, converts to Judaism. They, they are worshipers of Yahweh, what the Bible refers to as God-fearers. Some people try to say that maybe they're Jews who, you know, lived out among the Gentiles. That, you know, there was a bit of a division. 
You had the Jews who were in Jerusalem, in Judea, those people who, they, they were the pure ones. They were the pure people who followed God. And they looked at other Israelites who lived off in other Gentile nations as kind of a lesser than, kind of, a, you're not really Jews, right? And so uh, some people say, well, maybe it was that. But that's a totally different word. I'm not going to bore you with the details of the Greek, you know, vocabulary here, but there's a different word for kind of Greek, you know, speaking Jews, and then there's another word for Gentiles. Two totally different words, and it's talking about Gentiles here. And the fact that it says it's certain Greeks, they're, they're certain Greeks, they're not just some Greeks, they're certain, these people, these individuals that come to Philip and say, hey, we want to talk to Jesus. These are some specific people. It's referring to some specific, now it didn't tell us who, but it does say some certain ones. Now, pure speculation on my part, but I think maybe these are some Greeks who already knew Jesus. Maybe they'd already heard him speak in some other town somewhere because we know that Jesus went around, spent some time in Galilee. Galilee had some Gentiles who lived in the area. It was right next to Gentile-dominated area. And so they would have had contact and trade. And there were actually times that Jesus went through Gentile territory and was teaching. So perhaps these were some guys who already had heard Jesus speak. Maybe they had met the disciples in Jesus at some point. That's speculation, but it makes sense to me. Um, so they're not just some random people. And somehow they know or they recognize or they're kind of drawn to Philip. It mentions that Philip is from Bethsaida. Bethsaida is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, which is probably the closest to places that would be interacting with Gentiles. And so may, maybe, they're, maybe they know him. Maybe there's just something about him that they kind of, you know, are drawn more to or more familiar with. Uh, the name, uh, in fact, Philip, it's a Greek name. It's not a Hebrew name, right? And so for some reason, they're drawn to him. It has something to do with his being from Bethsaida. Whatever the reason that is, they come and they say, hey, we want to see Jesus. We want to talk to Jesus. We're in town for the feast, and we want to hear Jesus, which they wouldn't have been able to do, most likely, because in the temple, it's separated. Gentiles, even though they're allowed to come and worship Yahweh, are not allowed into some inner parts of the temple. they got some outer courts that they're allowed in, but Jesus wouldn't have been there. He would have been in the Jewish part of the temple. So they come and they say, hey, we want to talk to Jesus. And they go and they take, you know, the request to Jesus. Now, here's what's really interesting, and it really frustrated me. And I searched and searched and searched and searched and couldn't find anyone trying to actually give a good answer to this question. It does not tell us whether or not Jesus received them. And that really bugged me. That's one of those details of a story that you're just like, okay, so what happened? Because it says that Philip told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. And in the very next verse, Jesus is going to start teaching something. It never tells us whether or not he received the Greeks. So what happened? Did he just like leave them hanging? Right? Did, did, did they come and say, hey, there's some Greeks that want to talk to you, and Jesus just blew them off and ignored them? Right? We have no idea. It doesn't specifically say, and that really, really bugged me. But I think he did, and I'll tell you why. In previous encounters that Jesus has had with Gentiles, where Gentiles are trying to get to him or Gentiles are trying to call on him or something, he specifically mentions, I've come for the house of Israel. I'm not here for them. I have come to the lost of the house of Israel. He doesn't say it at this point. Every other time he does. He makes a point to say, no, I, I'm here for the lost children of the house of Israel. I'm not here for the Gentiles. That's not that time. But at this point, he doesn't make an issue to say that. So I, I think that there's some very significant things going on here that we're going to see unpack, that, 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 that Jesus actually does receive them, that Jesus does go and talk to them. Then also the fact that the very next verse says, so Jesus answered them, right? Them who? Just Philip and Andrew or the Greeks. And I think that we have reason to believe that he um, actually goes to see them. If he had just said, tell them to go away, I think it would have been recorded. I, I really, because every other occasion it is. And so I think it would have been here as well. So I think that Jesus most likely did go to see them. And I think there's some significant things in the fact that they're even mentioning Greeks trying to come to see Jesus at this point in time. 
verse 23. Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you that unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. And he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now, one reason why I think it's significant that the Greeks would have been here to hear this is because look at the phrases that Jesus is saying. He who, anyone who, he's casting the net wide, anyone. Some Greeks come to Jesus, and then Jesus gives an answer that says, anyone who comes to me, anyone who follows me. He does not just say, no, no, this is just Israel. Some Greeks want to come see him, and then the next message he gives is that anyone who serves him, his father will honor. Not just the Jews. The Jews are very... uh, particular about thinking they're the only ones that God loves and God's just waiting for the moment to smite everyone else and Jesus is saying no. Okay, don't miss the importance of the idea of the Gentiles being there. He's saying if anyone, and he's speaking to a crowd that includes Gentiles. By the way, Gentiles, that, that, that's you and me. Right? If this isn't true for Gentiles, we're all wasting our time here because we're not Jews, so Jesus wouldn't have come for us, except he did. And we know he did. The scripture says that he did. Jesus is proclaiming himself to be not, I mean, yes, the Messiah of Israel, but not only the Messiah of Israel, but the Savior of the world, the whole world, not just the Jews. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, by the way, Ephesians, that's the town of Ephesus, which is a Greek town. So he's writing to Gentiles, and he says in Ephesians chapter 2, Now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, having been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from two thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. What he's saying is, there's not just Jew and Greek, there's not just Jew and Gentile, Christ has made the two one family. In Exodus 19, verse 6, Moses points out that Israel is meant to be a nation of priests. They were God's people on the earth to represent and proclaim him to the world. And they failed. Right? We sing the song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No. Well, Israel did. Israel said, no, 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 this little light of mine, I'm going to hide it and keep it to myself because we're God's chosen people and the rest of y'all can just forget about it. That's the attitude Israel had. That's not what God had called them to do and to be. And so where Israel had failed, now Jesus succeeds. Salvation for all people, not just Israelites. Now I think what is getting expressed here in the rest of this passage where he's talking about if a seed doesn't fall, it won't bear fruit. Uh, If you want to save your life, you have to lose it. What's being expressed here by Jesus is what I think is a very core and very central principle and aspect of Christianity that we all have to understand. And it's referenced and repeated over and over and over again in a whole different kind of ways, but it all comes down to humility and selflessness of putting aside pride and self-centered focus. It's one of those things that if you're missing this, you're kind of missing the whole point of Christianity. This is the issue of Christianity, the theme running through all of Scripture. We've talked about this before when we kind of walked through the, uh, we did the Bible Fast Forward series, and we talked about what is the singular theme. There's all kinds of other nice things, but the one thread running through all of Scripture is the sovereignty of God. He is God. He is King. We are not. 
The idea is that God is sovereign, but man has rebelled, and God is calling man back into relationship and right position with him. And understanding this helps us to see that sin is not merely doing bad things. Do you understand that? That whenever we talk about sin, is lying a sin? Yes, it is a sin. But it's not merely that you're doing something bad. Sin is an attitude, it's a perception, it's a way of thinking where we desire to elevate ourselves beyond what we are supposed to be. We want to be kings in our own lives, captain of our own ship. How dare anyone tell me how I should live my life? That's the attitude that undergirds all sin whether it's lying or stealing or whatever it is, that we say, you know what, God, you, I, I know you say not to do it, but, you know, if, you're, if you look in the appendix in the Bible, it's got a little note there that says it's okay for me, right? Because my situation's special. Right? That, that's the attitude that we have as we go through life. <clears throat> I had a recent conversation with uh, an atheist, and something, that, it wasn't even the point we were talking about, but something that got said just, like, leapt out at me, and I thought, wow. That right there is the mindset and the attitude of pride that undergirds sinfulness. See, atheism entails nihilism. Nihilism is the idea that life is purposeless, meaning unless there's no, I mean, there's no good, no bad. Right? The, the idea of success or failure, of being happy or being sad, it doesn't matter. Either one, do whatever. There is no purpose, there is no meaning, because there is nothing greater or more beyond adding value or purpose to anything in life. It's all just random. You could go be giving and caring and loving and help the poor, or you could go be greedy and steal and hurt people. It doesn't matter. Either one would be just the same on atheism. There's nothing undergirding it to give any kind of meaning or purpose or value to life. See, but atheists still claim, no, 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 see, we give meaning to our own lives. That, okay, there may not be an overall meaning, but we give meaning to our own lives is what they try to claim. But the thing is, meaning or purpose has to come from an outside source. Has to. Literally cannot exist from within. Because purpose has to do with the design and function for which you were made. And if there is no function or purpose or design to your making, there can be no purpose, there can be no meaning. It just is what it is and you can do whatever. Right? A car is for driving on the street, not in the lake. Why? Because that's the way it was built. It wasn't built to float. Boats were built to float. But you know where you don't take a boat? Out on the street. It doesn't roll very well. It doesn't have wheels. It's not made for that. It's not its purpose. Also, um, you know, you might be able to put wings on a car, but then make it an airplane. Unless you're James Bond. That might work out for him. But generally speaking, right, cars are not planes. Boats are not cars. And planes are not boats. Right? Because they have a purpose. They were created and designed with an intended use and goal and purpose in mind. If you have no design, if there is no creator to say, this is what this thing was made for, it doesn't actually have a purpose, then life is meaningless. You actually need that outside design of purpose in order to have any purpose at all. So if there is no creator, there is no purpose and meaning. But this person I was talking to, they actually expressed the notion that they must be allowed to make their own meaning, that they are not going to accept a worldview that says some other meaning is imposed on them. That the idea that God would have a purpose or design for their life was repulsive to them. That's the very heart of the sinful nature of mankind that's gone askew since the fall. How dare God try to tell me what to do? I will decide what I do in my life. They weren't even trying to do it, but by, doing, by saying what they said, they expressed the, the whole point of what the fall entailed and how we are trying to get back to God. I will decide, I will control, I will be the captain of my own ship rather than Jesus take the wheel, it's Jesus get out of my car. My car. No, it's his. Or to put it in terms of this passage we're reading, they love their life. And Jesus says because of that they will lose it. 
he who loves his life will lose it. Not because God is being spiteful or vindictive that you would choose something else and so therefore he's going to take it away from you. It's just the natural way of things, the consequences of the choices we make that as we choose to live our lives against God, we lose our lives. In the Greek, that word translated lose, it has this uh, idea to it of destruction. That the reason we lose our lives is because our lives are being destroyed. That as we make choices against God and say, no, I don't want to do things your way, I'll do things my way, thank you very much, that we're actually destroying our own lives as we do that. By pursuing what we think we need, we're actually doing the exact opposite and harming ourselves. As it says uh, elsewhere in Scripture, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. And, and if you think about it, there's all sorts of even good things in life that whenever we make that our ultimate thing, we, we actually end up tearing down our lives, damaging and harming our lives and the lives of those around us. Whenever we decide, I will make my own meaning, I will make my own purpose, and we make it about something that God did not intend it to be, things go bad. You might be really good at business. You might be really good at your job, and that's where you find your meaning and your purpose, and so you're driven in your career, and then the shattered lives of your family are left in your wake as you pursue that meaning and that purpose of success and figure, I'll play with my kids tomorrow. Next thing you know, they're graduated and gone, and you are so consumed with that meaning of success and career but it did not satisfy, and indeed it harmed. Or maybe there's some other form of personal pleasure you want to pursue. God, don't tell me how to follow my romantic relationships. I will decide the right way to pursue those. And of course, those of us who have made those bad choices know full well there's no satisfaction in there, but only grief. Time after time, the things that we choose that to make the meaning of our life about even good things can end up leading us into destruction because they're not meant to be the ultimate thing. God is. By choosing the temporary fleeting things of this life, we're choosing to not receive the things of eternal life. Does that make sense? It's what is called in economics, it's called opportunity cost. Right? You can only, if you get one thing, you're losing the opportunity to get the other. The Bible says you cannot serve two masters. You'll love the one and hate the other, or love that one and hate that one. Well, the two masters in view here is God or you. Which master are you going to follow? Because if you choose to follow the master of yourself, you're going to end up hating God. By choosing the one, you give up the opportunity for the other. Um, as I was uh, thinking about this, a uh, kind of sad, funny um, example came to mind. Uh, a few months ago, I think it was, uh, we had, I think I'd made some cookies, and you know, got some, you know, little slice and bake, you know, from the store, and I'd made some cookies, and um, for whatever reason, uh, Olivia didn't want cookies at the moment. Well, now, sweetie, if you want a cookie, you better get it now because they may not be there later. No, no, I'm okay. And she insisted she didn't want a cookie. Whatever she had in front of her, that consumed her attention, and she wasn't thinking about, didn't care about, wasn't interested in the cookie. Until later, when that thing was no longer consuming her attention, and she remembered, oh, there's cookies. I want a cookie. There were no cookies. Cookies were gone. Opportunity was lost. Now that is a little, and you can imagine how the reaction was, right? A little bit of a melt. Now, whenever a four-year-old wants a cookie and there's no more cookies, that doesn't tend to go well. And often, you know, we react the same way, right? Well, whenever sinners say, I want my sin, and that's what I want. I want to follow me. I want to follow my pride, and I don't want the things of God. And then they realize the emptiness of the things they've been pursuing. What do we do? We lash out. We have a little tantrum and a meltdown. It's all God's fault. Well, no. It's not God's fault, because he was saying all along, don't choose that, come choose me. But we chose that instead. So Jesus' warning here, 
He's warning that if you choose this life, you are giving up the life to come. There's an opportunity cost involved. Which life are you going to pursue? The pleasure of this life or pursuing the life to come? That's what he says in verse 25. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. That's the choice. Which life are you going to pursue and cling on to? The real life, the eternal life that we were meant for and designed for, or the fleeting, temporary things of this life? But he's not just teaching abstract principles. This is what I love about Jesus. He's not some guru that sits on a mountaintop dispensing wisdom. He gets down in the mud with us, in the filth and messiness of life, and he shows us the way through it. He puts it into practice. In verse 24, whenever he's talking about a seed of grain, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain or fruit. We are that fruit. What he's talking about here is his own death. Right? He could just go back to heaven. He could look around and go, these people are nuts. Father, Holy Spirit, we're better off without him and just go back to heaven all by himself. But he doesn't. He dies. He goes through the humiliation and suffering of the cross to bear our burdens, our sins, our transgressions that we might be saved. As he's saying, if a seed of grain doesn't go into the ground and die, it can't bear fruit. He's talking about his forthcoming crucifixion. Because it is in that moment, in his crucifixion, that moment on the cross, and this is one thing that people just find mind-blowing about Christianity, it's on the cross in that moment of shame and humiliation and suffering when the world looks and says, what a loser! It says, then that's when the Son of Man is glorified. He said it right there. The time is coming. The hour is here when the Son of Man will be glorified. And how is he going to be glorified? That seed is going to go on the ground and die, so he'll bear fruit. And he's referring to his crucifixion. That it is in the, that the glory of Christ is found in the sacrifice that he makes that you and I may be made whole, may be forgiven and reconciled to God. His glory is not merely the fact that he's King of kings and Lord of lords, sovereign of all things. I mean, that's pretty glorious, but that's not all of it. The glory of Christ is in his selfless love and his willingness to sacrifice himself in this world that we might have eternal life in the world to come. And then the crazy thing, and this is the hard thing, that this is the hard thing for us day to day, day in, day out, that what we are called to do is to emulate Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, it says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant. Let this mind be in you. By the way, you notice the little thing I did? Let this mind, you need to, if you weren't here Saturday last Saturday, you need to go back and listen to Eric Hernandez's talk about the soul and what it actually is and thank you. This isn't what thinks. Your brain is not your thinker, your soul, your mind. That's your thinker. This is just some weird habit we've developed in our culture. So whenever I say your mind, no, no, your mind is in your soul. That's not in your head. Anyway, um, go listen to that talk. He does a great job. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ, who made himself of no reputation. But what do we do? We pursue our reputation, our success, our greatness, our pleasure, our fulfillment here in this life. Me, 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 gimme, gimme, gimme. Isn't that what we do? Right? It's not just me. Is it just me? I hope it's not. I don't think it is. That's how we all live day in, day out. And we pursue things that aren't even bad things. But in our pursuit of them, our thinking is of ourselves. So what Christ is calling us to is that we recognize God's sovereignty. Not our own, but God's sovereignty. That we set aside our own pride that we set aside our own self-centeredness and we follow Christ's example in selfless, sacrificial love, that giving of ourselves in this world, that we might be a blessing to others in the world to come. 
Every time I feel the walls close in Recover me and breathe life in me again Lord, though I feel the darkness come I will not fear you've ransomed me with blood 